Great. Well, thank you. And I'm in Shepherd's Bush, so, so in West London. So uh, should we just start with a prayer in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit? Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who has taught the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by the gift of the same Spirit, we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So, as we know, so that English Catholic prelates shouldn't harbour pretensions. Cardinal Hume used to tell a story against himself. As Archbishop of Westminster, he was travelling back to Ampleforth when he looked to fulfil a boyhood ambition. Would it be all right, he asked, if he could travel up front with the driver? The driver looked at him very quizzically. It was all highly irregular. But then gradually a look of recognition flickered over the driver's face. An exception could be made, he supposed. And so the Cardinal proudly surveyed the instruments, the gauges and the dials. But his pride was quickly punctured as he overheard the driver's whispered conversation at the platform at York. He said, you'll never guess who I've got up here with me. It's that Archbishop of Canterbury. Cardinal Bourne had a similar experience. He was traveling back from Canterbury by train in September 1903 when the press broke a story concerning the Catholic Church. Recognizing the collar, but not the cleric, a fellow passenger thought he might be interested and handed Bourne his newspaper. Would you like to see this, sir, he said. And so Bourne read for the first time of his appointment as Archbishop of Westminster today. Westminster. Today, his obscurity is even more profound. Francis Bourne was Archbishop of Westminster for over 31 years, 1903 to 1935, the longest Archbishop of Westminster by some way. But mention Cardinal Bourne to anyone today, and the chances are they'll mishear you and think we're talking about his predecessor, Cardinal Bourne. So what should Bourne be remembered for? As his biographer, I've got quite a long list. We tend to forget that the Liberal government of 1906, elected with a massive majority, was determined to end the state funding of faith schools, a disaster for Catholic elementary schools. Bourne displayed consummate leadership and emerged successful, refusing to ally himself with the forces of Tory reaction, working with Irish nationalists and with liberals where possible, but utterly uncompromising on principle. His sane approach to the emergence of the Labour Party prevented working class Catholics having to choose between their faith and their politics. He also had a similarly balanced approach during the modernist crisis. Bourne was the first cardinal to work easily with an emerging Catholic middle class, laity, evidenced by his encouragement of the Catholic Federation and the Catholic Women's League. His uh, approach to the incipient ecumenism and the Malin conversation was far more benign than was generally believed at the time. But he understood that ultimately, the Catholic Church alone could be relied to speak to dogmatic and moral truth. In war and in peace, Bourne spoke to his co-religionists in a way they could easily understand. In the last generation, academics have begun to reassess Bourne. For example, Kester Aspden in his survey of the early 20th century political landscape and Alan McClelland regarding Bourne's role in the education crisis. But at a popular level, the reputation still persists. For many people, if they've heard of Bourne at all, it tends to be in the context of his spectacular row with Peter Amigo, his successor as Bishop of Southwark, a row that went on for 40 years. So when I began my research 20 years ago, older priests still divided firmly on one side or the other. I was invited to talk about Bourne 
to the priests of Southwark Diocese. And I was warned that Amigo's biographer, the late Father Michael Clifton, was going to be present. So I deliberately spoke up to the hour to limit the scope for questions. But the moment I sat down, Father Clifton's hand was waving in the air. Father Vickers, he said, I'd just like to say I disagree with every single word that you've said over the preceding hour. So why does Bourne still have this capacity to engender controversy? Bourne's appointment to Westminster came as a surprise to most and was highly unpopular with many. A member of the Catholic establishment wrote, I know many leading and active Catholics who are deeply disappointed in the appointment of Bishop Bourne and would certainly have preferred Monsignor Mary Duval. I think Abbot Gasquet would have been the man for the higher interests of Catholicism. Bourne hadn't been on anyone's radar for very long. When he was proposed as a coadjutor bishop for Southwark seven years earlier, the English hierarchy left blanks in the paperwork, not knowing either his Christian name nor his age. In fact, Bourne was appointed bishop at the age of just 34. At the time and subsequently, conspiracy theories abounded to explain his meteoric rise to Westminster. Some said the Roman Curia was foisting a traditionalist on England. Others blamed the intervention of the Duke of Norfolk. For others, it was the fault of the French. Some said it was Aussie disregard for protocol. Only the last reason has any grounding in fact. Cardinal Moran of Sydney arrived late for the conclave which elected Pius X, but he did manage to attend the meeting of propaganda to consider the Westminster appointment and spoke in Bourne's favour. Motivated, it's said, by an Irishman's distrust of religious orders in general and his Benedictine predecessors in Australia in particular. Bourne himself had no doubts. He said the reason for his appointment was God's will, and I can only follow his divine providence. There were, of course, more prosaic reasons for Bourne's appointment. Even popes are constrained by the pool of actual candidates. In 1903, most English bishops were either aging, infirm, or lacked any real experience of London. The hierarchy really struggled to compile a turner for Westminster. They finally arrived with three names, Mary de Waal and two Benedictines, Cuthbert Headley and Aidan Gasquet. And anti-Catholicism was still powerful in 1903. Imagine the effect in Protestant England had Rome appointed a Spaniard as Archbishop of Westminster, Rafael, Maria, Jose, Pedro, Francisco, Borgia, Domingo, Gerardo, de la Santissima Trinidad, Mary de Val and Zuleta. And of course, Rome had other plans for Mary de Val. Nor was the country ready at that stage for a Benedictine monk. The bishops knew that they were presenting Rome with an impossible choice. Therefore, they added a fourth name, Francis Bourne. Westminster was in a mess in 1903. Vaughan had been a national figure, but he wasn't a great diocesan bishop. There were virtually no priestly vocations and no seminary. Vaughan had sent his students to the Central Seminary at Oscott. Bishop Carhill of Portsmouth wrote to Rome to press Vaughan's case. Carhill argued that Vaughan had a great power of organization with a thorough grasp of detail. The Diocese of Southwark was completely and perfectly organized, but most especially his seminary was a triumph of order, method and careful thought. And the whole merit of this was due to Monsignor Bourne. What Westminster needed was organization and its own seminary. Rome agreed and they appointed Bourne. Some welcomed Bourne's capacity for administrative organization and his determination to restore the Darson Seminary. But his appointment to Westminster wasn't universally popular. The Jesuit, Alban Goodyear, wrote that Bourne himself knew very well that many looked on his appointment with misgiving. 
He knew still more that somewhere at the back of his mind were ideas and ideals which might be less than pleasing to many. I plan to explore the reasons for this supposed unpopularity and to assess such a judgment. There are two obvious blots on Bourne's time in Westminster. In 1920, Bourne was still trying to achieve the multiplication of bishoprics in England. He felt that the hour of the Catholic Church had come. The country was ripe for conversion. Faced with the alternative of internal confusion and division in the Church of England, the men in the trenches during the First World War had been presented with the reality of the Catholic doctrinal and sacramental system. Prejudice was on the wane. There was a new respect for Catholicism. All it required, Bourne argued, was zealous and capable men. A bishop in every major city, a priest in every town and village. And then he thought converts and an increase in ordinary Catholic life would inevitably follow. Bourne proposed, for example, the ecclesiastical unification of London, a number of new dioceses throughout the country, and some creative suggestions for their bishops. He might have been right, but with the exception of Brentwood and Lancaster, it came to nothing. Rome blew hot and cold, supporting Bourne at one moment, then backing his opponents at the next. And then the plans were too bound up with his vendetta with Amigo. Bishops were unwilling to consent to the division of their own diocese. Bourne was outclassed by two skilled political operators. Amigo stood up his brother bishops, while Gasquet had the ear of successive popes in Rome. And Gasquet had never really forgiven Bourne for pipping him to the post in Westminster. He used his influence to block Bourne's cherished plans for more dioceses. It should have become clear that the plans for diocesan division were going nowhere. But Bourne was nothing but stubborn and refused to let the matter drop. And that stubbornness soured his relations with the rest of the hierarchy. The Bishop of Northampton described him as an autocrat of the most Prussian type, who consults no one other than himself and wishes to stifle all opinion opposed to his own. Bourne was also accused of being anti-Irish. I found no justification for this. He was half Irish himself, the son of an Oxford movement convert father and a mother from Dublin. The anti-Irish accusations are founded rather on the Cardinal's response to the Irish troubles after the First World War. Bourne favoured moderate home rule. His failure consisted in his perceived partisan approach to the violence which then enveloped Ireland. He condemned IRA atrocities, but not until it was too late, the lawlessness of the, the Crown forces, the Black and Tans. Usually politically astute, prolonged foreign travel and illness adversely affected his response. Bourne's priorities were the unity of English Catholics and English public opinion. And he failed in a higher duty to condemn the real injustices committed in the name of the British people. His proposal for diocesan division and response to the Irish troubles caused Bourne deep unpopularity. But neither was at issue, of course, in 1903, so why the early unpopularity and suspicion? Snobbery was a factor in some quarters. Some wrote off Bourne as a postman's son with false pretensions of grandeur. Vaughan had mixed easily in the country house parties of Tory grandees. Vaughan didn't. Yes, his father worked for the post office, but he was a highly skilled civil servant, negotiating postal treaties with foreign powers, seeing legislation through Parliament. Vaughan was unambiguously middle class. In many ways, an advantage, leading the Catholic Church into the 20th century. Jealousy also played a part in Bert Bourne's early unpopularity. Older priests, particularly the Southwark chapter of Canons, resented the choice of Bourne at such a young age to found the seminary at Wanish and to succeed but as Bishop of Southwark. 
A number judge themselves better qualified by reasons of seniority and experience. On the eve of his installation as Bishop of Southwark, the canons of Southwark threatened to boycott their own bishop's ceremony. Bishop Carhill admitted Bourne's unpopularity during his early years in Southwark. He wrote he was initially unpopular because he was very vigorous. Financial and spiritual laxity during Bishop Butt's old age and illness had to be challenged. Carhill maintained, I believe that his justice and his zeal are now quite understood and that he has now conciliated all the priests and canons of his diocese who completely appreciate his ability and work. Some Southern clergy may have begged to uh, differ. Bourne didn't respond well to criticism and conflict. Losing his father and only brother at an early age, he grew up remote and reserved, oversensitive to perceived slights. He was appointed a bishop too young, and not until he had been at Westminster for many years did he develop the maturity and self-confidence to provide spiritual paternity to all his priests. Born ought to have been the ultimate clerical insider. Few had attended as many ecclesiastical institutions in the course of their education and formation. He was at Ushaw, St. Edmund's Ware, Manning's New Seminary of St. Thomas's Hammersmith, and he undertook further studies, studies at Louvain. He tested his vocation briefly with the Dominicans, and as a curate, he asked to be released from Southwark to join the Salesians. Prophetically, Don Bosco advised him to return to England. He could be of more use, he said, to the Salesians back in the diocese. But one institution above all exercised an enduring influence. Comments on Bourne by Abbot Gasquet always needed, need to be treated with caution. In one respect, however, he identifies the pertinent issue. Writing in 1903, Gasquet maintains that Bourne's notion of education is too foreign to please most people. Bourne spent only two years at Saint-Sulpice in Paris, but those two years were decisive. The seminary there had been founded in the 17th century by the Sulpician founder Jean-Jacques Ollier. It stood in stark contrast to the English seminary system, St. Cuthbert's Ushaw and St. Edmund's Ware, which were heirs to the Dowie tradition, where lay boys and seminarians studied together in the same institution. Bernard Ward, president of St. Edmund's, stated that the college objective was to give the boys habits of self-command and true manliness based on solid Christian principles. That could have been taken from the perspective of any Victorian public school. And Bourne felt that these English seminaries concentrated too much on turning out Christian gentlemen rather than the formation of Catholic priests. Sansal Peace, in conformity with the decrees of the Council of Trent, educated future priests separately, separately from lay students. The regime was more intellectually rigorous, the objective more exclusive the formation of disciplined Catholic priests. And one figure in particular influenced Bourne, John Baptist Hogan, who was an Irishman who taught at Sansal Peace for 32 years. To understand Bourne, one should read Hogan's book, Clerical Studies. Bourne found there a spiritual zeal sometimes lacking among the more pragmatic English. Catholicism must be made intelligible, and attractive to the modern world. And that meant a radical critique of the intellectual formation of priests. Hogan wasn't interested in the regurgitation of scholastic manuals. To the student himself, nothing of what he learns is of any value, unless he is thus taught to realize it and make it his own. Cardinal Bourne always acknowledged his debt to the Sulpician fathers. Their students, he wrote, saw in the Sulpician formation staff, true examples and models of priestly life. They make no pretense of being anything more than priests. They find in their priesthood the source 
and reason for their holiness of life. Their lives are simple, they are unassuming. And without exaggeration, in the simplicity of the furniture of their room and of their other surroundings, they're content with a small stipend. They lead the lives of their students and are ever at their disposition in any matter of which they can be of service to them. By being true priests, they lead their students to an efficacious desire to become like them. Bourne sought to emphasize this model in the seminaries for which he was to have responsibility. None of that sounds exceptional today. A century ago, it was hotly contested. Bourne had served as curate in Blackheath in southeast London, Mortlake in southwest London, and West Grinstead in Sussex. In each parish, he engaged a passion for teaching. He had a real gift for discerning and promoting priestly vocations. In Catholic schools and orphanages, he taught the boys to serve at the altar, chant the mass, and make the Latin responses. And that gift when Bishop Butt decided in 1889 that the moment was right for Southwark to have its own seminary, he turned to the 28-year-old Father Bourne. The decision to found St. John's Seminary Wanish was controversial. Cardinal Bourne was in the process of centralizing English seminary education at Oscott. In order, he said, to offer a higher level of studies in one large seminary, rather than in several small diocesan seminaries. The demise of the central seminary at Oscott was largely due to Bourne, establishing his rival institution at Wanish, and then later withdrawing the Westminster seminarians to re-found St Edmund's Ware as his diocesan seminary in Westminster. The issues at stake were rehearsed in the pages of the tablet in 1893. The Oscott professor, Victor, so Father Victor Schobel stated the case for the Central Seminary. He said that the Catholic Church in England was too poor and too small to implement Trent's ideal of a separate seminary for each diocese. Economies of scale and an adequate intellectual formation dictated centralization. Recognizing the threat to his fledgling seminary, Bourne went into print to defend Wanish. During their training, seminarians, he said, should be close to their bishop. A diocesan seminary created a sense of unity amongst its priests. Dioceses such as Westminster and Southwark were large enough to have separate seminaries, and students from smaller dioceses could be admitted there. Bourne defended the separation of lay and clerical students. Their needs, he said, were different. The seminarians being trained for that time when aged 24 or 25, he is placed in the world, practically alone, with no one to turn on, turn to, and all men depending upon him. Bourne took issue with the suggestion that a seminary exists to give a university education. This, he said, was neither desirable nor necessary. Those displaying an aptitude for further studies could be sent to Catholic universities overseas after ordination. The seminary's priority is the spiritual and practical formation of men for parish ministry. Cardinal Bourne graciously maintained that Bourne's approach was another way of doing things and wished him well. Schobel, however, continued to argue fundamental principles. And here we get to the crux of the matter. Schobel bore witness to Bourne's zeal and to the true priestly spirit that breathes through his writings. But nonetheless, he said, we feel that the conclusion to which he would lead us would be a national calamity, a national calamity. Schobel's words were echoed by Father David Fleming, an Irish Franciscan working in Rome. He said, I look upon the attempt to engraft the Sulpician system on the Catholic Church in England as a calamity. The experience of France is not encouraging. What Schobel and Fleming feared, what made Bourne unpopular with others, was the belief he would impose a French method of priestly formation. The education of seminarians separate from lay boys, they felt risked 
creating a priestly caste apart. And they felt that their fears were given substance by the experience of anti-clericalism in France. Far better they held to continue the Dawi tradition of mixed education, where those destined for the clerical and lay states grew up al alongside one another, supporting and appreciating one another. To Bourne, that was a charter for amateurism and worldliness. The priestly vocation, he argued, was sacred and challenging. It required a formation of part to produce a spiritually developed professional clergy, prepared for the demands of parish life. Without such training and clarity of purpose, he felt the conversion of England would continue to proceed only haltingly and piecemeal. Appointed rector of Wanish with his bishop's support, Bourne didn't hesitate to implement Sulpician principles of priestly formation. He and Bishop Butt went to great lengths to ensure that the new seminary at Wanish wouldn't be contaminated by the tradition of existing English seminaries. Wanish's growth was to be entirely organic. There was no transfer of current Southwark seminarians from other English seminaries. Instead, starting afresh year by year, a new class of seminarians emerged who knew nothing other than this system. And they were taught largely by older seminarians and newly ordained Wanish priests, supplemented by lectures from Sansal Peace and Freeborg. Affiliation to the Institut Catholique allowed seminarians to receive undergraduate degrees from Paris. That the seminary was exclusively for those contemplating priesthood went without saying. A specifically Sulpician practice was introduced from the outset, the Lectio Spirituelle. Every evening except Sunday, Bourne gathered all the seminarians around him for an intimate talk on any spiritual topic, a matter connected with daily life or the general principles of spiritual formation. In the older English seminaries, the staff could seem very remote from their seminarians. They lived like Victorian schoolmasters, apart from their charges. And that horrified Bourne. Drawing on his experience of the Sulpicians and Silesians, he was determined that the seminary should be a family. The seminary staff were not merely instructors in learning, but primarily directors of those who were to be priests. They were to lead a community life for the students, sharing in the spiritual exercises made in common, having their meals with them in the refectory, joining freely in their games and recreation, and training them more by their own self-denying example than by their words. The seminary was to be their sole occupation. Born led by example, seminarians were encouraged to approach him without any difficulties. Rather than avoid his company, they sought it out. One of them wrote later, I don't suppose that anywhere in England there was such hero worship and filial, filial respect as we had for the rector when Bourne was rector of Wanish. Bourne's arrival in Westminster was predictable. He wrote that his priority was the training in knowledge and virtue of those who aspire to the ecclesiastical state. And no one was particularly was surprised when he decided to withdraw his seminarians from the Central Seminary at Oscott and restore St Edmunds as the diocesan seminary. Speculation began as to whether he would at once proceed to remodel St Edmunds College on the lines of St John's Seminary at Wanish. Would the lay boys be sent packing? Would the relaxed, gentlemanly Dowie tradition be replaced by Sulpician rigorism? And uncharacteristically, Bourne hesitated. He made moves in the direction of radical change, sending the president of St. Edmunds to see how things were done at San Sulpice. But Bernard Ward's English character was more than immune to French spirituality. He noted his attendance at a most, most go-ahead lecture, but when in France, he was far more concerned with the weather the quality of seminary cuisine and the te test match scores back in England. Bourne persevered, sending two other members of staff to Sansal Peace, Edward Burton and Edward Myers. 
They engaged in long conversations with the Sulpicians on the method and training of students and the forming of the priestly character. But when asked to implement change, Burton resorted to a familiar device of the English Catholic Church. Change was unnecessary because the desired policy was already being pursued, just in a manner appropriate to the English character. Burton assured his archbishop that the spirit of Sansal peace in its essentials of learning and holiness seems akin to our own spirit in St. Edmund's, that we may enter into the work as a thing not new to us. So very politely, Bourne was being told that an institution with a 300 year old history had no intention of adopting to the whims of a transient archbishop. Bourne poured massive sums of money into St. Edmund's, building and renovating the plants. In the 1920s, he devised a house system, partly to achieve a degree of separation between the lay and clerical students, partly entertaining delusions of grandeur, wanting to turn the college into a Catholic Winchester or Eton. But he never achieved a fundamental change of ethos. He still had time to berate the staff, for preferring the life of public schoolmasters. The seminarians would only benefit from the staff's presence, Bourne maintained, if the staff lived alongside the seminarians and sh shared the same food, eating at the same table, something that the staff bitterly resented. Bourne wasn't content to leave his vision for a different, more focused and zealous form of priesthood at the level of seminary formation. Priests had to be enabled to live differently after ordination. How could diocesan priests best be assisted to live the spiritual life amid the pressures of parish ministry? As Bishop of Southern, Bourne felt that he hit upon a solution. Again, the inspiration came from Sansal Peace. Ironically, it was in connection with these plans that Bourne urged Cardinal Bourne to release from Westminster, a young Gibral Gibraltarian priest called Peter Amigo. To the irritation of older priests, Bourne appointed Amigo as Vicar General of Southwark. And together they studied the constitutions of French associations of secular priests, like the Sulpicians, who lived together in community and supported one another in the pastoral life and the quest for personal sanctification. That model was alien to most English parish clergy. Members of their Society of Secular Priests, this body set up by Bourne and Amigo, were committed to a simple life, detached from the world, living and holding clerical income in common. The diocesan bishop was to be the superior of the society, and they were give, to give primacy to the spiritual life as set forth by the French masters of the 17th century. Many priests argue that Bourne was undermining the essence of diocesan priesthood. They weren't ordained, they said, to live in religious community. Was it practical that the superior was always the diocesan bishop? What if he had no taste for such things? How could the bishop, a spiritual father to all his clergy, protect himself from accusations of favoritism to members of the society? In the end, it came to nothing. The intention was that Bourne and Amigo would travel to France together to see at first hand how the Sulpicians and others lived out their common life. Bourne was detained by circumstances. Amigo had to travel alone. Shortly afterwards, Bourne was transferred to Westminster. So what did Bourne actually achieve? There's no disputing the increase in priestly vocations. Within eight years of Wanish's foundation, 89 seminarians were studying for the Diocese of Southwark. When Bourne arrived at Westminster, there were virtually no local vocations. Within a generation of refounding St. Edmund's Ware, it was a thriving institution with 120 seminarians. And much of that is down to Bourne's organization, his determination and his own priestly authenticity which drew potential vocations. He guaranteed an ample supply of priests for both dioceses well into the 20th century. Did Bourne, however, decisively change the character 
for the Catholic priesthood in England. Contemporaries noted that there was something distinctive about the first generation of Wanish priests. But overall, the answer has to be no. On his transfer to Westminster, Bourne was desperate to retain control of Southwark, to protect the unique character of, of Wanish. And that's why he really pushed to have Amigo appointed as his successor in Southwark, something he came to regret. And Amigo quickly came to regret and resent Bourne's interference in Southwark. The two men fell out massively over the seminary. Bourne alleged that Amigo was undoing his structures so carefully assembled at Wanish. The regime of formation was changed, outside members of staff were appointed with no experience of Wanish's Sulpician ideals. Amigo, however, was the diocesan ordinary. Just as Bourne had been entitled to establish the seminary, so Amigo was entitled to change it. Likewise, the Society of Secular Priests didn't long survive Bourne's move north of the Thames. Bourne lacked a similar opportunity in Westminster. His attention and energies were distracted elsewhere. At St Edmunds, he was confronted with the tradition of centuries. None of the staff really understood or shared his views on formation and priestly life. A century on, no long-term change survives. Those debates about seminaries and societies of priestly life, so heated at the time, can seem irrelevant today in comparison with so many of the national and international issues of Bourne's Episcopate. But I submit that isn't necessarily the case. What was at issue was the very nature of the priesthood in England. Contemporaries understood that, hence the passion and the acrimony. There have always been those who've maintained that the delay in the conversion of England wasn't so much the lack of priests, but rather an inadequate supply of truly committed and zealous priests. Bourne's initiatives were designed to address this. And we can only speculate as to the results had he been given the time to implement this fully. Others violently contested his proposals. They would, it was argued, impose a divide between clergy and laity, opening England up to the anti-clericalism rife in much of continental Europe. Who was right? To some extent, the question's ongoing, and it's theological rather than historical. Is the church the shining city set on a hill, or is she the leaven in the flower? Archbishop Downey of Liverpool wrote Bourne's obituary in the Westminster Diocesan Periodical. He felt that Bourne's closest spiritual affinity was with Cardinal Manning. He said the two men had much in common. Initially, that comparison puzzled me. I've come to believe it may be correct. The English Catholic hierarchy is small, tending towards introspection. In very different ways, Manning and Bourne are the only two outsiders to have led the Catholic Church in this country. Both sought a renewal of the priesthood using similar means. Manning's Oblates of St. Charles and his Seminary of St. Thomas Hammersmith corresponded to some extent to Bourne's Society of Secular Priests and St. John's Seminary Wanish. Those two cardinals offered a different way of doing Catholicism in England. What would the Catholic Church be like had they succeeded? That's one of the fascinating questions of ecclesiastical history. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brother Mark.